everyone and welcome to another episode of the V Brown Bag podcast. Uh, today we've, we're joined by Matthew Mayer f- um, talking about availability and resource management features which are new to vSphere 6.5. Now, just before we hand over and let Matt introduce himself, we'll just cover a few quick notes. So, if you want to follow anyone from V Brown Bag, through Twitter, we have a couple of different Twitter handles there, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, with our primary one being V Brown Bag and a couple of regional ones below that. Also, we always use the Twitter, the, the hashtag um, V Brown Bag, and we have a number of different podcasts, as you can see on the right. As I mentioned before, our guest today is Matt, with his Twitter handle below, and I'm your host Brett Johnson, um, and I'm on Twitter at Brett Johnson double zero eight. So if you're all ready, Matt, I will hand you over. Uh, I'll hand over a presentation to you for you to give us a rundown. Sounds great. Thanks. All right. And here we go. Everything good? Can you see my screen okay? Uh, not just yet. It flicked up, but disappeared again. Oh, here we go. Right, now we're good. Now we're good? Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, thanks for uh, letting me join this evening uh, or morning, wherever you're at. Um, uh, again, I'm Matthew Meyer. Uh, work in the vSphere Technical Marketing Group here at VMware, focused on availability and resource management features. Um, specifically around the new vSphere 6.5 launch that we launched just around uh, VMworld um, Barcelona last year. And so uh, I've got quite a few little topics to cover, so I'll just kind of dive right in here. Uh, The first is around vSphere HA and uh, the proactive HA feature. And so what this does is it um, works in conjunction with our hardware OEM partners, and these are like the Dell, the HPs and the Cisco's of the world. And what we do is uh, we work with their hardware um, hardware management platform monitoring system. And what it's doing is it's plugging into vCenter and notifying uh, vCenter of any type of component failure that is um, or an unhealthy component within uh, each individual ESX host. And so for, uh, for an example, there could be a fan that is not uh, spinning at the proper RPMs, or uh, it could be a network adapter that uh, has failed for some reason. And um, when the partner's, uh, hard, uh, the partner's software management platform detects these type of failures, we can then take action uh, before an actual uh, impactful failure could occur. And so... What we do is uh, very simply is when we detect these type of failures uh, coming from that management solution, we'll then just simply vMotion the virtual machines from the impacted host to a healthy host uh, within the environment. By doing this, we introduce a new uh, mode with, uh, within vSphere. Uh, we call this quarantine mode. So similar to you know, maintenance mode where you would do an entire host evacuation of all of the VMs, uh, within that host, uh, we now do them um, when we detect that there's a component failure. We'll do uh, place the state uh, of the host in quarantine mode. And when this is in quarantine mode, we will not place any new virtual machines on that host. And as long as there is uh, sufficient capacity on the rest of the cluster, we'll go ahead and move all of the VMs off. Um, or at least as much as we can before there is any type of uh, performance impact on the cluster. And so the idea around this is that, uh, you know, if, you, if you've got a, a imminent failure uh, within the host that you think that is going to cause uh, a host to go down, the best thing to do is to uh, detect that early and get the virtual machines onto healthy host as quickly as possible, preventing any type of outage uh, on the virtual machines. Uh, it is leveraging DRS to do any of these moves, so DRS is going to be a required feature uh, that you'll have to have in addition to uh, a vSphere HA, which is available on even the lowest SKUs. But 
um, to use this feature, you would have to uh, use uh, any of the, the additions that uh, include uh, vCR DRS. Um, in addition uh, to, to that, a couple more, uh, couple more uh, details around this is that uh, you can choose uh, whether or not a different component is considered a moderate degradation or a severe degradation, and then you can choose how you want to respond to those different uh, types of component failures. So if you think a fan failure, for example, is more of a moderate degradation where, hey, you know, it's, it's not going to probably kill my machine. Um, I don't necessarily need to evacuate the host. I can place that into more of a quarantine mode, so move them if I have sufficient capacity. But uh, other types of failures you could deem a little bit more severe. Um, so those types of failures can be placed into um, uh, severe degradation or labeled severe degradation. And in that case, uh, you can choose uh, to completely evacuate the host, um, uh, whether that in by placing that into a full maintenance mode uh, instead of just quarantine mode. Um, throwing a host in the maintenance mode is going to do exactly as you would always do for a maintenance mode operation. DRS comes in, makes its placement decisions um, for all of the virtual machines and completely uh, evacuates that host. Um, Oh, back to that. It isn't going to, however, violate any of your business rules, uh, DRS groups rules, affinity rules, uh, any of those uh, types of hard constraints that you've placed in the environment. We're not going to violate any of that whenever we do uh, either a maintenance mode or a quarantine mode. Just um, I've just got a question raised here. Uh, yeah. Sorry, and I just uh, by Ken. Um, what would happen should a host go into a um, quarantine mode to a ma moderate degradation and another host goes into a severe degradation. Um, basically, how would the um, VMs be able to, would the VMs go back to the uh, moderate one to help unload the severe one? Oh, in that, yes. Uh, in that case, gosh, I've never tested that. I would have to assume that the severe degradation one would take priority. Um, Any one that's been placed into a, a uh, a maintenance mode based on the rule. I would I would assume that is, that is how that is. I've never actually tested that, but uh, that is how I would uh, picture it working. And um, one more question actually from myself. These rules where you can say, you know, a fan failure is, uh, puts it into a certain level of degradation. Is that a cluster-based setting or can it be overwritten at the host level? It is a cluster-based setting and it is uh, applied per type of failure in this case. And it's not necessarily down to each host level. Um, it is only down to, uh, to the cluster level. And what's interesting, though, is uh, a lot of the times we, these management components do share a lot of things. Um, and it's a lot of the times up to the vendor to decide whether or not um, a shared component would impact all of the, the, the hosts in that cluster or not. Um, a good example is, is power supplies on a, uh, on a blade chassis system. Um, if we detect that there's a power supply failure and all of the hosts in the cluster are sharing that same power supply, it doesn't make a lot of sense to place every host into a degradate, um, into quarantine mode and moving all of the machines all over the place because uh, all the hosts would then be infected or affected by that um, uh, component failure. So in that case, uh, we, we wouldn't essentially be able to place all of the uh, hosts into either a maintenance mode or a, or a quarantine mode. And so it would at least be intelligent enough to detect those types of uh, shared components in, the, in the, uh, the blade chassis. But if we're using standalone rack mount servers, um, again, then it would uh, kick in in that case and, and move the machines around uh, where you have the, the sufficient capacity. Uh, configuring it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's just a checkbox. Uh, the little uh, in information icon there, what that's detect or showing you there is that you do need to enable DRS before you can enable Proactive HA. And then the second step for this would be to um, install the uh, the web client plugin for whatever vendor that you're using for uh, for your hardware. 
And then this is where you go into the automation levels or the, uh, the remediation, how we discussed uh, or how I discussed uh, the different types of modes that you can place your host in as each failure is detected. And then you can, on the very bottom of that screen, you can override those as, um, as you want to, if you want to uh, uh, perform a certain action for a certain type of failure and override the, um, or take a certain, I guess, uh, action. Uh, based on a different uh, certain component failure. So I've got one more, uh, another question from Alex here. Um, should all our Dell VMs require being added to the Open Manage software, or um, or does the Open Manage only need to be added to the host? It is a host-based thing. So um, we'll we'll receive the information from the Dell Open Manage as far as the host health and component health. And then we'll know which hosts are um, being impacted um, by that, and then by extension, which VMs are on that host, and then make the uh, intelligent de placement decisions at that point to, to move the virtual machines to other hosts in the cluster. All right, um, moving on to uh, restart priorities. Pretty simple, straightforward, and, and uh, virtual uh, vSphere 6.0 and before, we had three um, priority levels for vSphere HA. We had the high, the medium, and uh, the low priority. And these are different uh, groups or priority levels whenever you had a, a host failure, how then um, capacity is being allocated to the rest of the cluster to restart the virtual machine. And so this is, um, if you don't uh, reserve enough capacity, um, you can di dictate at least which uh, virtual machines would come up uh, first, and then um, it would then allocate the capacity for the, for the next remaining priority level. So high being the first priority, and then it, after uh, all the virtual machines for that priority level has been allocated its uh, resources, it moves on to the uh, medium priority, and then finally the lowest priority. Um, in uh, vSphere 6.5, we've introduced two more priority levels, uh, so you'll have a little bit more control on how to group the virtual machines as far as capacity. Uh, we simply named this uh, highest priority and lowest priority, and so it's, uh, it's configured the exactly the same way as you did in previous versions. It's just that you have two more uh, priority levels available to you. Extending on the priority levels, though, we have what we're calling the, the vSphere HA orchestrated restart. And this is similar to kind of a vApp within vSphere, how you had the ability to create startup order. And uh, we're going to implement that same type of logic. The only difference is we're putting this on a cluster level, and you don't need to enable vApps in order to use this. Um, very common uh, use case for this is a, a three-tier app uh, across multiple virtual machines, and you, if you did have a host failure, you want to um, ensure that you start those virtual machines in the order that it would need uh, for the application to properly recover. And so in this case, um, if we lost this one host um, that happens to have all three of the tiers um, running on it, it would uh, then restart uh, the database server first. Um, once that has been successfully restarted, uh, the app server will come up, and then subsequently the uh, the web server would come up after that. Um, whenever you're creating these different rules, um, the web client is going to detect and um, keep you from creating any type of conflicting rules, such as a uh, a circular dependency. If you had two VMs de uh, dependent on the same uh, virtual machine, you 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 can't create a conflicting dependency there, so it's going to detect those and uh, it's also going to ensure that you have the uh, priorities, uh, the priority groups defined correctly as well. So, for example, you can't have, um, it, in this case, um, the database tier to be a medium priority and your app tier to be a high priority. It's going to uh, detect that and uh, prevent you from doing that. So, the, the virtual machines that start up first have to be either in the same priority level or a higher priority level than the other virtual machines that are dependent upon that. Um, and again, it's going to detect any of these rules for you um, or any um, 
violation of those rules before you're able to apply them. As far as uh, how this is, uh, you know, how it's implemented in, in practice, we've got kind of an example here. We've got a free host cluster. And what I have here is um, a blue application that's running across four virtual machines. And then I have a red application that's running across a different set of uh, those four virtual machines. And you can still run standalone virtual machines as well. They're just uh, going to kind of uh, jump around, and they're not going to be impacted by any of these uh, dependency rules that we have here. And so for this case, um, I'm just going to create a simple dependency chain where VM2 is dependent on VM1, VM3 depending on 2, and then VM4 depending on 3. And that's the startup order that I would like to, uh, to configure for that. And then the same for uh, the red application, very similar uh, startup dependency order there. And so if uh, I lost uh, the first host in this cluster, what would happen is that VM1 and VM8 would actually start at the same time. And uh, the reason for this is VM1 uh, does, uh, is going to start up because it doesn't have anything that depends on it's waiting, um, it's waiting on to, to restart that virtual machine. It's not dependent on anything else, so it's going to start right away. VM8 doesn't also depend on, um, or it, I'm sorry, it depends on VM7, and that was already running um, on that third host, so it's going to immediately kick off and, and restart. And then once uh, VM1 has finished its restart, or um, you can define it by um, uh, a wait, a period of waiting uh, between the restarting of the virtual machines, or you can um, detect that the application has started by either the VM tools or the, uh, the application APIs uh, that also work through the VMware tools to detect whether or not the, uh, the, dependent, uh, the dependency has uh, successfully started before um, you kick off the next uh, one in the chain. And so if you have VM1 that has started and everything is successful, VM2 is going to wait, and then it's going to um, restart after uh, VM1 has finished. We reset that uh, same example, and then we have the third host that fails. Uh, the dependency is going to be, or the restart is going to be a little bit different in this case. Uh, if you don't create any other rules, they're all going to restart at the same time. And again, this is because VM4 is depending on VM3, and that was already running on that second host. VM5 doesn't depend on anything, uh, so it's going to restart again right away. But VM7 uh, depends on VM6, and that's the only rule that was uh, initially created here. And so since that rule was satisfied, it's also going to start at the same time. Now, the red application might have something in it that doesn't like that. If uh, you restart that VM7 at the same time as VM5, it may completely avoid this entire process, and this, the, the, the feature um, entirely. So it's very simple to, um, you know, uh, get around that, um, and that's simply just create another rule set for VM7 to also depend on VM5. And so in that case, it will uh, VM7 will uh, pause and wait for VM5 to uh, completely come up. It will then look to see that VM6 is uh, up and running, so that uh, dependency is satisfied, and then it would go ahead and restart uh, VM7. As far as uh, creating the different rules, uh, we, it's a two-step process here. Uh, the first being the VM host groups, and so this is uh, already something that you would create um, uh, within the uh, the same way that you create like DRS groups uh, and, and different rules like that. The, so the first thing you would create is the the VM group, and the and you would apply the membership. And so in this case, we have different VM groups with only a member of a single VM. In this case, uh, VM one. VM2 example, uh, and so on. And then the second step is where you actually define those dependency rules. And so in this case, um, VM group number one um, is going, or VM2, rather, uh, the VM group number two is going to depend on all the VMs that are um, started in VM group number one. And so 
the the rules, the dependency rules are actually VM group to VM group rules, not individual VM to VM. And so that's why we've created in the prior step um, a group of a single VM. And uh, then you would just create the, the simple dependency rules throughout here. So VM1 dependent on VM, uh, VM, sorry, VM2 dependent on one, VM3 on two, VM4 on three, and so on. And that's going to uh, allow to restart those virtual machines in the proper order. I'm going to pause here and uh, have any questions about that feature? No, the questions are nice and clear at the moment. OK, good. Moving on to admission control. Uh, this is. Oh, wait, wait. I don't spoke too soon. Ken's come up. I have a question. All right. Sorry, Ken, if I missed that, I may have missed that question. Sorry, you can't type fast. <laughs> Uh, we might that. Yeah, I just here we go. Can VM three depend on VM one or VM two? It um, it's not an or. It's got to have to be an and at this in this case. But if that's something that. Uh, yeah, I can I can definitely see how that would be something that could be useful because you could have um, the same function residing on two VMs. So as long as one of them is up and running, it should be safe to start then the uh, the next virtual machine in the uh, dependency chain. And so that yeah, that is interesting. I'm going to pass that on to the product team because uh, that would be something that would be nice to have as a as an OR within the uh, Within the VM group, so I would, I would think that you could have a VM group that contains a couple of virtual machines, and then a rule that says, hey, as long as I got one of these up and running. Yeah. Go so ahead and Ken's Ken's example there was a uh, domain controllers, and that's actually quite a good one yeah. because if you're looking for like the DNS service, one of the one of the two just needs to be up. Right. That's that's actually quite good. Um, yeah, I'm going to pass that along. That's a that's a really good question. So yeah, right now it is an and, um, like kind of a forced one-to-one -one dependency, um, not like anything that's uh, super intelligent where it can do these, you know, if then and ors or, or anything like that. So internet high five for Ken and no other questions. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Moving on to admission control. Uh, so admission control is how we um, set aside uh, capacity in a vSphere cluster. So if there is a failure that happens, it, you kind of uh, ensure that you have sufficient capacity set aside for these uh, virtual machines to restart. Uh, we've simplified the configuration, uh, making this a little bit easier. Uh, by default, from version six to six, you know, and all the way back to the first version of vSphere, uh, admission control has always been based on a uh, number of hosts to fail. And then we do this whole slot size calculation thing. That was always um, the most um, conservative in the fact that you would always reserve way too much capacity. And conservative being that uh, you're, you're going to get these virtual machines to restart, but at the same time, you could be wasting uh, capacity um, in order to, uh, to to have that uh, reservation set aside. Um, so what most of our customers would do in that case is that they would uh, go in and they would just change the admission control policy to a percentage based. Uh, what we're going to do starting from uh, vSphere 6.5 and, and uh, all future versions is we're changing the default policy uh, from that slot slot-based policy to the percentage of cluster resources. But we're going to get the best of both worlds here, and we're going to ensure that or require that you define a number of hosts that a cluster tolerates. And so by defining that number, 
um, if you wanted n plus 1 or n plus 2 or so on, uh, you can uh, you, you define that number, you change your policy to percentage of resources reserved, and then in the background, uh, we calculate the number for you. So you no longer have to um, figure out what n plus 1 or n plus 2 is based on a percentage. You choose that as an integer on step one there, um, and then in the background, it's going to do all that math for you. If you add a host to a cluster, it automatically recalculates. If you remove a host from a cluster, again, automatically recalculates and changes the, uh, the percentage that, um, that you need to satisfy that one host failure, uh, uh, fail, failing. Um, it's also smart enough to detect uh, worst case scenarios. So if you're running um, different sized hosts in the same cluster, by defining a uh, value of one, it's going to always choose the worst case scenario and choose the proper percentage to reserve based on the worst uh, host or the, the largest host in that cluster fail, uh, failing. The other thing is that uh, we do offer the ability to override that. So you can get the former virtual uh, vSphere functionality um, simply by uh, choosing the override button and then forcing or um, uh, by a user definition what the uh, the CPU and the memory percentage should be whenever you reserve that. So again, very simplified approach to this. Um, you kind of get the best of both worlds now where you're defining the, uh, the number of hosts that you want to fail. Um, reserve that, um, but we're reserving that now as a percentage of the resources reserved. So um, it's pretty, uh, pretty sweet in that regard. Okay, we've got a... Uh, we, sorry, just... Yep. Got a Question here from Kevin: uh, Is it possible to get a vCPU to um, physical CPU ratio? Yeah, and I'll cover that. Actually, that's a DRS setting that we have now applied. So we're going to enforce that using DRS, but we'll get to that here in a bit. Um, on the percentage, uh, this is just a couple of extra screenshots here to show what that would look like. Again, um, we have the uh, you define the number of uh, failures that the cluster will tolerate. Uh, by default, it uses the percentage of resources reserved. Uh, we also can still do the slot-based policy. So you can choose, um, again, defining how many uh, hosts that you would uh, tolerate within the cluster, and then you can uh, let it do uh, its slot-based calculation. And again, you could go in and override that using a fixed slot-based size doesn't make a lot of sense, honestly, now that uh, you have a fixed slot base size, but uh, we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. I don't see a lot of value in defining a fixed slot size anymore. Um, so uh, I, if, if you, I guess, uh, are thinking of a reason why you need to do that, I'd, I'd love to hear it, but um, I don't see a lot of value in, in doing the fixed slot, slot base size anymore. Um, especially now that we automatically calculate the percentage. So that's a, kind of a there for old uh, or for upgrades, I think. And then, um, but uh, I wouldn't see any uh, new environment using that. And then finally, we have the, uh, the dedicated failover host. Um, that hasn't changed at all in, in any of the versions. Uh, what you're doing in this case is you're just setting aside one of the hosts that will be the recovery host. So if one of the hosts, any other host in the cluster were to fail, this is the one host that's going to uh, bring all the virtual machines up. So uh, it's gonna tax that host, depending on how many virtual machines failed. But uh, one nice thing about that policy though, is that you get a guaranteed amount of resources reserved for it. So um, if you wanted an N plus one, you define the, the failover host and you get the same performance um, after a failure as you did before the failure. So that's uh, one really nice thing about the, uh, the failover host policy that I think uh, a lot of people kind of miss um, on that is that, uh, yes, per uh, performance will be the same. Which actually brings us to the next thing here is what we're, uh, we're trying to address is when you do set aside resources, um, using admission control uh, 
to ensure that the reservations within the cluster are going to be satisfied after uh, one of the hosts were to fail. But if you don't use reservations, you don't necessarily guarantee the same performance of the virtual machines after one or more of the hosts failed in the environment. It's always going to guarantee resource, uh, the resources are going to be there for anything that has a reservation. But if you don't use reservations again, um, if you've overcommitted your hosts, um, vSphere HA will still be able to power them on because there isn't, there isn't a reservation for that. But if uh, the consumed memory does exceed what uh, the entire cluster can provide, you will see those uh, memory reclaiming techniques that uh, you have whenever you do over allocate a cluster. So you could see, if you push it a little bit too far, you could see uh, memory uh, ballooning. You could see some swapping or compression in those cases. So just something to be aware of. And so what we're trying to do to um, make that a little bit more transparent so you don't have a performance problem after a vSphere HA event is um, we're allowing you to define a resource reduction event threshold. And so by default, it's set to 100%, uh, which means it's the same as what it was in all um, previous versions of vSphere, meaning that it's not going to um, give you any type of warning or anything that uh, your virtual machines could have impact to performance after a vSphere HA event. Um, by changing this to, say, 0%, that is indicating that you want no performance penalty after um, you lost a host uh, within the cluster that um, also is in line with how many uh, host failures that the cluster tolerates. So for an example, if you have a four host cluster, you want to reserve an N plus one uh, or N minus one so you would reserve 25%. Well, if you run all of your hosts at 75%, um, you're going to now have to move um, or have to restart all of the virtual machines from a host that was already running very hot. Um, and so you're going to now overcommit the cluster, um, moving the, the virtual machines over from, other, uh, from that failed host. And so in that case, um, you would have a um, reduction of performance. And so what we're going to show now is a warning um, on the, the vSphere web client. If we detect that just because you've set aside um, some capacity for vSphere HA, and it will go ahead and restart those virtual machines, you could impact the performance of those virtual machines after that restart. And so. In uh, version 6.5, we're going to display that as a warning message. And what we're looking at for future versions is try to come up with ways to um, apply admission control based on uh, resource consumption and demand rather than just uh, based on what you've reserved for those resources. All right, uh, jumping now into uh, fault tolerance. Uh, fault tolerance on 6.5 is um, got some improvements, uh, especially around performance. There isn't any feature, um, imp um, new features for uh, uh, fault tolerance with uh, 6.5. Um, so as far as like the the, uh, the feature itself has not changed. Uh, it's not going to do any thing extra for you. Uh, there's no more than four virtual CPUs, for example, 64 gigs of memory. Everything's reserved. All the same requirements uh, from version 6 apply to version 6.5, so you'll need that uh, dedicated um, 10 gig link um, to do the, the fault tolerant logging, and you'll still need the, the shared storage for the uh, primary VMX file and the tiebreaker files. Um, the, uh, the VMDK files can reside on dedicated storage, um, similar to how you could do that with uh, vSphere 6. Um, so that hasn't changed. However, we've made some functionality improvements where um, we have some, we, we now integrate better with DRS when doing FTVMs. And so it's going to now 
when you enable uh, FT on a virtual machine, it's going to reach out to DRS. It's going to ask it, okay, so where is the best place to put the secondary VM? Uh, it's also going to look at different things, um, especially around how much networking is available on the secondary host to ensure that you don't go, just by enabling FT, that you don't overrun uh, one of the, uh, the secondary host network. Uh, another thing, it will prioritize the data stores. Um, so it gives you a recommendation of where to put the secondary VMs, uh, VMDK file. And so what's different about uh, vSphere 6 and 6.5's 6 FT compared to version 5 is that we do make a whole secondary copy of all of the, the VMDK data on a secondary location. And so it's now at least giving you a recommendation of where you should put that, um, that data to ensure that it, A, is a separate data store from the primary, and then second, you have enough space on that secondary data store and give you the, uh, the best place to put it. There's also been a lot of uh, focus on performance uh, between 6.5 and 6, though. And so they've gone through and they've done a lot of um, tuning on the network stack, as well as doing... Um, uh, the primary and the secondary host communication um, has been improved quite a bit. And so we're seeing um, drastic improvements between even 6 to 6.5. And then we applied those actual, those same fixes that we did for the 6.5 launch, we applied those backward compatible to 6.0 update 3. So anything that you can do in 6.5, as long as you've upgraded your ESX hosts to, to 6.0 update 3, you'll get those same improvements. Um, what we were seeing is that uh, in the initial launch of 6.0, um, FTVMs um, would suffer a little bit of extra latency between the primary and the secondary, and in some latency-sensitive VMs um, or applications within those VMs, it could, um, even the, the additional overhead of that latency did impact those, uh, those applications. And so what we've done is uh, we've really tuned that quite a bit to... Uh, to reduce the latency as much as possible between the primary and the secondary. And by reducing that latency, it, um, it increased the performance within the virtual machine. And then the final thing that we're doing is uh, just like you can do a multi-NIC vMotion where you create two separate uh, VM kernel port groups and then um, create uh, a physical NIC, or you bind a physical NIC to that port group, uh, you can do the same now with, uh, with FT. So it will um, bond, essentially bond these uh, multiple uh, PNICs uh, to create uh, an increased virtual network channel. Uh, so you can get those additional lanes of communication uh, between the primary and the secondary host, giving you even more uh, capability within uh, uh, FTVMs that are, are producing a lot of uh, bandwidth and a lot of network traffic, you can uh, essentially create these additional lanes. So if you don't have 40 gig networking or 100 gig networking, you can uh, bound, uh, excuse me, bind multiple 10 gigs together and, and, and get the same benefit from that. All right, jumping into uh, DRS. A uh, couple of advanced features that uh, we've now brought over from what used to be uh, advanced settings in the uh, in the in the product through an advanced setting uh, that you would have to uh, apply manually. We're now just bringing those over to a UI, so simple, easy to do checkbox, and it applies to to the whole cluster. The first being an even distribution of the virtual machines, uh, DRS. Uh, first and foremost, we'll always load balance, do initial placement, or anything based on utilization of the compute resources. It doesn't care that you've got 20 virtual machines on one host and 60 on another, um, as long as the, v, uh, the VMs are getting uh, the resources that they need. Everybody's happy, so it, it, that's not its you know, primary intention. By enabling this feature, um, it does um, allow you to avoid putting all those eggs in one basket. And so it will do a more even distribution of the VM count on the host within the cluster. And so if you do lose one host, 
you kind of have an idea of the impact of how many virtual machines you would lose uh, from that one host. And then secondary to that, it would balance based on the um, based on the utilization or the consumption rate of the resources. Um, if for some reason, though, that the virtual machines are not getting what they need on one particular host, um, and you have this enabled, it will um, violate the uh, even distribution for the uh, ability to get the best performance out of that, the, the virtual machines. So just something to to know that it, it is going to, to work in most cases, but it will violate that if it needs to uh, under certain conditions. Uh, the second uh, that we brought over is load balance based on consumed memory instead of active memory. And so one interesting thing about DRS is that uh, one of the biggest, con uh, I guess, things of confusion, what most vSphere admins will, will do is they'll look at their vSphere web client and they'll look at uh, the host tab, and they'll look at the, the memory consumed. And they'll notice a lot of times that uh, they're not in balance. And we'll get a lot of questions about, well, why is DRS not moving my virtual machines to keep my cluster in balance, even though I've told it, you know, I've, I've changed the migration threshold very high, or um, I, I'm not seeing any virtual machines, well, or move around. And the, the biggest reason for that is DRS, is using the active memory of the host plus a 25% buffer. Um, and what people are looking at in the vSphere web client is actually consumed memory. So it's two different memory metrics that are being used uh, to make uh, placement decisions. And so if you're not over allocating memory, it doesn't hurt to use the consumed memory me uh, metric instead of the active memory metric. And so the idea around that is that if you're not over uh, committing memory, you can, um, in, in previous versions, you would just set this advanced setting for percent idle VM in mem demand to 100%, which would effectively cause DRS to use the consumed memory metric instead of active, and then it would rebalance the host based on that consumed memory, which also then happens to be the same memory metric that you see in the web client. So just by clicking the box, a lot of customers are going to see a more even distribution of memory resources, um, but it, it may or may not necessarily mean the performance is any better. It's just that you're going to see a, a, a prettier UI. Your cluster is going to look a lot more balanced. And then last, uh, what we've done is provided a way to um, implement a virtual CPU to physical CPU overcommit ratio at a cluster level. So this goes back to that question that we had earlier, is there a way to uh, define that? Uh, and this is how you would do that, is if you want to ensure that you don't overcommit a cluster, um, and then by extension, even a host, uh, you would implement this um, this uh, checkbox, which would keep uh, virtual machines or to, yeah, virtual machines from being created and then powered on on a cluster um, that you define a certain uh, overcommit ratio uh, ceiling. And so um, a good use case for this is a VDI environment where you may have certain situations where um, peaks and valleys of performance. So at the beginning of the day, a lot of people are coming in, they're logging in for the first time, then their applications are running, they're idle, and you might see a dip, but you need to plan for that, that peak. And so just because the average utilization over that cluster is you know, moderately moderate to low, um, you don't want to overcommit the cluster. And so you want to define some kind of a policy that ensures that you don't uh, do that. And so this is what's uh, preventing any type of uh, overcommitment of the virtual CPUs in the, in the cluster. And then finally, uh, we have the uh, network aware DRS. And so this is a little different than network DRS. Um, it is just, it's, it's not going to rebalance hosts. Uh, within a cluster simply based on uh, network load. 
Instead, uh, we're still going to base everything based on CPU and memory load uh, as far as the compute resources. However, we are going to make one more additional check for DRS to do before it places a virtual machine on another host. And it's going to then look now at the utilization rate of the uh, physical NICs on each host. And so if for some reason a virtual machine is running a little hot on one host and it's not getting the resources that it needs, uh, DRS will come in and make a new placement decision for that virtual machine. And uh, in prior versions, it did not uh, ever look at the network utilization rates on all the other hosts in the cluster. And so if a host is already network saturated, and what we mean by that is any host that is over 80% utilized, uh, DRS will no longer use that host for a placement of a virtual machine. It will then move to the next uh, host in line uh, for placement decision. Uh, so we're not going, uh, we're just trying to over uh, subscribe the links and uh, make better placement decisions for DRS. So it's not network DRS where it's balancing uh, virtual machines strictly based on network load. Um, it's still using CPU and memory, but it's one additional check that it does in its workflow when doing placement decisions. And the same thing happens again also with um, uh, any type of placement decision. So it, it could be due to a um, affinity rule. It could be due to a host going into maintenance mode. Um, any Anything it's going to do, it's going to uh, make that additional check. Uh, and then uh, it's going to, uh, the idea is to avoid a problem that is related to uh, network saturation. All right, that um, is the end of the, uh, slide deck I had. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to uh, answer those as we uh, close this out. At the moment, questions are looking quiet. We'll just give it a second, see if anyone pipes up with anything. I think we're looking done. So thank you very much for that, Matt. It was definitely very insightful and a lot of tips that we'll probably, um, many of us will end up using on our day-to-day -day administration of a vSphere infrastructure. Oh, thanks. Yeah. All right. So, thank you, everyone, for attending. And this has been another podcast for V Roundbag. Oh wait, hold on. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh wait, nope. I enjoyed this webinar very much. No questions. There we go. So you go. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, great. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate the the opportunity. I'll uh, let you guys get back to it. Thanks.